So, software en uh, engineering and software maintenance course, again, welcome back to the first lecture of the fourth period. Uh, this week we are talking about software maintenance tools, uh, but we are focusing heavily on one aspect of these things, which is the software test automation tools, since they are as equally important in the original software development process as they are in the software maintenance process to ensure that the fixes and things we add during a maintenance cycle to our live software actually works. So uh, this week uh, we are doing again uh, these online lectures as we have been doing before and uh, we are also not having the consulting hour, not because I don't want to give it, but because we are also doing international uh, master's program uh, interviews for the whole week. So unfortunately, I'm very scarcely available during this week. But uh, to, this is something that's more or less administrative talk. We uh, probably can start with the uh, thing we always do uh, talk about last week's uh, topic and things we uh, talked about last week. So last week we were talking about two aspects, the software product lines and uh, software configuration management. These are the two things that are very much about software maintenance and also things that are uh, important when we already have a code base or resource base or assets which we want to manage. The configuration management is more about having the different versions of the different aspects forming packages which we can maintain, whereas the product lines are the concept of developing new products and new services based on things we already have and maintaining a core library of different uh, functionalities which we can rewrap to make new things when we find new areas or things that we'd like to have. So basically the software configuration management is more or less about ensuring that we always have the most recent version, the best version or the most uh, feasible version of things available. Like in this example picture which was also shown last week, uh, there's a po possibility to lose for example bug fixes if we are running different branches of software and overall if we are doing merges between the different versions then we need configuration management to figure out what actually is important and what's uh, useful things to carry out and what are the versions of different modules which are should be wrapped into one deliberate product or released product since if we are doing something larger or maintaining some huge code base, this might not be always necessarily straightforward. And there's actually even people whose main task is to run this configuration and version control management to ensure that the newest or the most uh, recent versions exist. This is also to ensure different development branches like having stable version or a, and experimental version separated. However, if we go further from having experimental version and uh, stable version together, then if we branch into completely different products using the same thing like engine or background systems or wrap our uh, service for use on new customers or do heavy tailoring to approach new uh, the markets or market segments, then we are talking about software product lines. The idea here is that we do core asset development, which are more or less the main parts of our software, whereas we, if we want to develop a new product, we select the core assets we need and use them to make a new product out of a, a more simplified or let's say a more uh, product focused aspects. This means that we take the core assets 
to get the basic functionalities and basic features, and in the product development only do the tailoring work necessary to make the new product or service exist. Of course, this requires additional layer of management, because we also are separating the core asset development cycles and product development cycles from each other, so there's bound to be a problems when our core library updates out of sync from our product, for example. So this also emphasizes the fact that we also need the configuration management, which was uh, discussed as a other topic on that lecture. So overall, the software configuration management and software product lines are things that complement each other or are required to run one or the another. So this is why these were also discussed as an, uh, on the same lecture and as a, as a more or less of a same thing within one product or within one product family, more, to, more or less to overly simplify the situation. But of course, this is, uh, has nothing to do with the actual core uh, lecture topic, which this week is software maintenance tools and test automation. Uh, this uh, entire lecture is actually based on other test automation lecture, which talks about uh, uh, from Aalto University by me and, uh, and uh, Juho Itkonen, which is more or less about how test automation tools are defined, what's the use for them, and how have they evolved during the last 10, 15, uh, 25 years they have existed in a large scale or, or have, be, have existed for a also smaller developers or as a service or feature uh, usable in even smaller scale software development. So basically, uh, Test automation uh, exists because the amount of quality assurance work uh, during the development cycle or if during the software maintenance cycle is just enormous. Uh, considering that during the development, we need to check that everything works to ensure that we get our product in time uh, with the resources and money and so on and so on and so on. But within, also within the software maintenance cycle, we are required to do regression testing to ensure that our fixes work, that everything actually still works as intended. This also means that basically during the software maintenance cycle, we are expected to do the entire system testing and integration and all the other stuff for the entire system every time we change something. And of course, this is laborious. This requires intense uh, resources, man hours, costs or time. And this, of course, is something that we really don't want to do by hand manually all the time because people get bored and then they get uh, frustrated and then they don't do their job properly. So, of course, the test automation is to ensure that at most of the cases or the most basic cases to see that everything still works as intended. So basically what we have here as a first part of the study is a practitioner's survey uh, from over 100 different industry professionals who have been doing uh, programming work, development work, testing work, quality assurance roles and stuff like that. First of all, of course, there's uh, some expectations on test automation. The benefits and the limitations according to literature studies are listed here. These are more or less the things that you'd expect from the test automation to do. So we have improved product quality, we have better test coverage, reduced testing time, reliability, increasing confidence on our product or the confidence on our on the quality perceived quality of the system, uh, better reusability of tests and tests and test cases, uh, less human effort to actually do the regression testing or do the maintenance testing and stuff like that, also saves costs and increases the fault detection rate. These are all nice things, of course, and things you would actually want to have. But on the other hand, there's also the num number of limitations. For example, uh, the automation cannot replace manual testing 
not, com not at least completely. The test automation exists more or less to ensure that the known things don't come back to haunt us anymore. And also, test automation, even though it, the most recent generation of test automation tools can be fairly uh, intelligent and good at their job, they're still just tools. They don't necessarily understand if something works improperly. And this is part of the Oracle problem, which is also an annoying thing, because it means that the test automation is really not something that you can expect to take over everything in a short uh, future. Also, well, they fail to achieve some expected goals, because the goals usually are unrealistic, and people expect more things than they can actually afford to do. Also, Test automation has the annoying habit of being actually very difficult to create, difficult to maintain and costly to have. So basically, you don't have, you don't necessarily have the people who have the right skills to do the test automation. Uh, you don't have necessarily the tools, which would be a good thing for the test automation, and you may not have the right strategy to do the test automation. So overall, the problem is that because this is usually, or at least was usually considered as a silver bullet uh, solving everything, then we the organizations expect that the test automation solves everything. And when it doesn't uh, get blame the people doing the test automation that they are doing it wrong, why are you achieving things? And of course, they usual problem is that the organizations do not understand that it's not cost free. If we change something in the system, uh, we also have to change how the test automation tests the system to ensure that everything still works, because the test automation really usually cannot just guess that, okay, this might have changed, or at least it gives a false uh, negative or false positive, whatever, uh, on the fact that this isn't working as it should be when when it's uh, just a positive change or something that was changed because we fixed something else. So the lack of maintenance funds and these sort of things usually are the things that scuttle software uh, test automation. And it it's something that you really need to commit to if you want to do it properly. So, uh, because, uh, because this is a software maintenance course, this, the, this first result is actually also the reason why I decided that if I'm giving a one lecture on the, uh, tools and it will be about test automation or the current state of test automation. Because the, usually uh, the most agreed upon thing is that the test automation suits and test automation tools and strategies and stuff like that only or mostly work in regression testing. So when you have existing product, you are doing maintenance work and you are fixing your software. That's where the test automation gets in. For example, like here shown on the slides, the reusability of tests is something that almost everyone agrees. This is a clear benefit we will get if we have a test automation working. So also repeatability, more testing in less time is something that actually works. And of course, we save effort, which translates also to money or time if we compare it to doing everything manually. And of course, uh, there's also a heavy belief that automation improves quality through better test coverage, because even very smart systems can see where the branches they haven't tested, and they are actually able to seek out ways to test missing things. So, of course, this uh, type of automation improves the quality, but it also requires very uh, sophisticated tools to actually capture these things. Of course, the software test automation isn't something that only gives you benefits uh, without any actual investment or requirements. Usually, like mentioned on this survey, the automation actually is quite costly to do. It's actually uh, very, very expensive if you have a large system or want high level of sophistication. But actually, in the long run, uh, 
in a, if we could think about years or some or sometimes even months the automation bears a high initial cost but actually saves money in the long run also one thing that usually isn't understood very well that actually test automation isn't just something that you set up once and then forget completely for the rest of your life no test automation actually needs extra effort for designing and maintaining meaning that if you don't do maintenance work also on the test automation side then you will have a test automation which is no longer relevant or in worst case scenario gives you faulty results which are of no use to your organization actually of course this isn't something that's completely novel or new idea even if we are doing for example manual testing we still have to maintain the test cases to keep the system uh, running or enable us to do regression testing uh, with the test set, case sets which uh, yield relevant results so of course uh, like these test cases when we change things also the automation requires uh, maintenance and of course uh, the maintenance work can be done well or it can be just done and this causes technical debt but still you ha you cannot discount the test automation maintenance as an cost if you are doing some real software maintenance work also of course since the automation by itself is actually a rather complex thing you should probably buy your tools and train your staff to use those old, uh, existing tools then recreate everything yourself and try to use that for test automation it's uh, simply not cost efficient to all make the test automation tools and support uh, maintain the test automation tools in addition to using those tools in the maintenance of uh, in software uh, test automation work so it's double costs with no real benefit on doing the tools yourself so this is also something that should be investigated at least when you are building the infrastructure this is also the reason why we are considering how we can uh, enable test automation in our project works because it's not always completely straightforward to do but it's still something that usually should be done if we want to have a so highly sophisticated software process especially on maintaining a large uh, large repository of existing code and assets so of course this also leads to the flip side of the coin uh, the test automation tools require people who are actually capable of using them this uh, this shouldn't be a problem really and this shouldn't be something that ex that's explained on the master's level course on software engineering but still actually this is something that uh, people making management decisions do not necessarily get software test automation is a separate profession and it needs people who are actually capable and trained to do those things to actually exist and of course this is also linked to the fact that the test automation tools may not necessarily be always available for every type of project uh, this is of course linked to testability and maintainability of the software itself but also to the tools which we are using to develop the software or the programming languages which we are using or the development environments or the IDEs or whatever tools we are using there's not necessarily test automation tool available for all different kinds of systems and we might have to actually need to change the development environment if we want to have functional or suitable test automation so of course changing the tools uh, to something else because we want to do some additional test automation might not actually always be something that we want to do so this is also something that curtails the amount of uh, usable or doable test automation in real life one thing i also mentioned earlier was that the automation was considered for a long time as a silver bullet of uh, testing so it's something 
that fixes everything immediately. Of course, it's not that. Automated testing doesn't replace manual testing. It just doesn't. You can replace the uh, things in which you ensure that things are still working as they as they used to be. But if you are testing out something that's new, something that's novel, something that's tried out for the first time, you have to do manual testing. And it's always a tool to complement manual testing. Uh, you do manual testing on the high value things or new things or things that you are testing out for the first time. And when you see that it actually works, you being the oracle saying that now it works as it's intended to do, then you develop the test automation to ensure that the behavior doesn't change. At least, and, uh, at least to a large degree, and if it does, then it tells you that this, is, this has changed. Is this still correct? And of course, this also means that the automation doesn't actually offer high fault detection rate. It's actually a thing that only ensures you that nothing has changed. The testers and the people doing the quality assurance work, whether it's the development uh, stage or main software maintenance stage, are the people who are actually doing the fault detection because they know what should happen, they know how it should work, and they identify and see when it doesn't do that, and they write the bug report. And then after the patch has been made or the fix has been issued, we add uh, test automation to ensure that this doesn't happen again in the future. Besides the silver bullet aspect, there are other organizational challenges in test automation in general. Like mentioned earlier, the inappropriate test strategy means that we are trying to automate wrong things or expect too much out of the test automation, or we are focusing on automating one aspect with no control or ability to uh, take into account some things from other places, so we are not doing diverse testing enough. Uh, we also might be focusing only on test execution, which isn't that important, especially if we don't have test sets or test cases which are maintained and we know that will function and provide us with correct results. This also means that our capability to run test automation deteriorates over time. Uh, we don't no longer we don't get reliable results because we are not maintaining our test case set and the integrity of the results is compromised. If we can't rely on the test automation, then why are we doing it at all? Also, like mentioned, the automation really cannot replace all manual testing. So, and this is something that has to be explained over and over and over again. Also, uh, there's the problem that test automation is considered something that it's, it fixes everything. We still have to design for testability and maintainability if we want to have testability and maintainability as, uh, as a feature of our existing resource. In fact, one of the uh, game studios I've been recently been working with is actually selling testable and maintainable code base and approach to that as their product simply as a service to other game studios, explaining that this is how you make something that works. Of course, this also means that if you want to automate something, you should be doing something that can be automated. And finally, finally uh, the test, uh, test for maintenance is hard. Now, test automation tools are a completely different beast. If we go with an artificial intelligence backed uh, self mutating test automation uh, tool, it means that it's actually a fairly complicated thing to set up, fix, and maintain over a long time. So, of course, you should consider, is this something that's actually needed in this project? Of course, if we are doing something like software production lines, 
then with the core assets, the answer is probably yes, or at least should be probably yes, because they are core things that exist all in all our products. But at some point with the Tesco automation, you have to ask yourself, is this uh, software going to face large enough uh, changes in the future or have long enough life cycle to warrant a full up upgrade to a new test automation tool? Final. And then uh, finally, well, as an organizational aspect, we also might want to consider are we, what sort of test automation are we doing? Because there's different levels of test automation, even though this picture here is a bit old already. I, I mean, it's uh, 20 years old, it could vote on the next government elections. Uh, the idea still here is, the, uh, is actually valid. Are we doing automated testing or just automated test sets? The automated tests mean that mean that we leave the execution and the result comparison to the automated tools, whereas the automated testing means that the system takes the test environment, does all the activities with the test cases, clears up the environments, creates as a report on what has happened, so that it actually tells us more information and actually manages everything and every layer of the activity. Of course, uh, these automated tests on the left side of the slide are something that's already understood as a test automation. Uh, but in the large scale, the automated testing work is something that actually is test automation in a sense that it actually ensures that everything works properly, for example, that the system or the test bed uh, boots up and sees that everything functions, it saves time, it saves, saves effort, and it's actually much, much more mature than, for example, the automated tests, which just run a set of pre-scripted stuff on a development uh, tool. If we consider the costs here, the manual testing is, of course, well, work which we might want to, at some point, uh, automate. If we just do some test automation because we want to do test automation, if it of course means that if we don't have enough use for the test automation suit, we, it just costs us more money to dabble with the test automation tools and set up things and analyze failures and see what happens, whereas we could just be do executing the tests by hand and then going away if everything works. Of course, the idea here is that we are trying to go towards more mature test automation, where we spend most of our time doing development of test work or maintaining our test sets and analyzing why it doesn't work or what should be changed to ensure that it still works and this is where we start to save time and effort and money and all these other things. In fact, uh, there's some uh, goodness of the uh, test thing here. Uh, the typical misunderstanding, the effectiveness of the test remains the same after automation and after many runs is actually a problematic because, of course, the effectiveness is only uh, as effective as it's uh, relevant and maintained. So, of course, we need to do changes to things that we have already automated if these changes are needed. So we can't say that we just make this automated part and we never have to do it again. So in this sense, all the graphs uh, showing the amount of repetition and when they when the test automation warrants the simple repetition are a bit wrong but the idea is still the same if we are uh, doing something that we have to constantly see uh, and check and it, that it still works as it used to work then of course it's an important or critical feature to automate because no one wants to test out the same library functions again and again and again but we still cannot warrant the situation that we might actually have to change things at some point in the future. And of course, I mentioned the Oracle a couple of times, 
already on this lecture. The oracle means that the uh, oracle is able to declare when something is a problem and when something is not. Or they can tell without a failure when something doesn't work or something works as intended and not just looks like it works as intended. So this is a bit problematic thing. First of all, because all even if humans are in general great oracles for software engineering, it also means that also the human may sometimes make errors. Uh, we might see that from the user interface perspective everything works wonderful, but on the but the database gives gets only garbled uh, trash to its uh, tables. On the other way around. We might see that the user interface starts to go crazy, but still everything happens as intended in the database part. So, of course, we may not always be able to reliably tell if something worked or didn't. And of course, like everything, if we add test automation and computer science to this problem, we get much uh, bigger issues with much more impactful things. Because how can we tell the computer that what we want or what things should look like, how things would wo should work. For example, well, the test automation, we can uh, give it an idea so that the window should look like this, the activity should look like this, the data should look like this, but it's still tripped by irrelevant discrepancies, meaning that we have to explain it what we want it to see. And uh, if we use skilled human, we can neglect many, many irrelevant things or many things that we which don't simply have anything to do with the uh, end result or which are acceptable things. But with the test automation, these things can simply cannot happen. So we have to create test frameworks which can explain to the test automation tool that what we want to see, what needs to happen, and how we need to do things. For example, for the test automation tool, the window opening on the wrong part of the screen may, may say that it's failure because the window didn't open properly, whereas we as a human might see that, okay, there's uh, the, window, uh, the window system of the operating system decided to open it here, so let's just move it here where it's, it, it's used to, usually opened and stuff like that keeps going and we know that the system worked without problem or at least the part which we are developing but the test automation can't make this assumption because it's not human and its rule set dictates that this was a failure because the window didn't open as defined. Of course, uh, there's some things which the human oracles use to recognize the defects. There's the consistency heuristics, for example, example explained here. So if it's consistent with history, consistent with image, consistent with comparable products, claims, users, expectations, product itself and purpose, then we might actually know that, okay, this is something, this within reasonable doubt will work as intended. Of course, how do we explain these things to computer? For example, how do we say that the uh, consistent with claims? The function uh, behavior is consistent with what people say it's supposed to be, or uh, the behavior is consistent with what we think users want. So how do we explain these things to a computer system? And uh, how can we ensure that we get the results we expected and can actually rely on the test automation and the results it's giving us. So, of course, there's a number of things which we can compare. For example, like Juha has listed here, there's a screen-based results, file-based results, web interface-based results, and, and interface-based results. So, of course, we can see that all these things happen. We give these inputs, we get these outputs, and everything should be working as intended. So, okay, these are simple cases. These are fairly straightforward to implement. If we give these inputs and press these buttons in an order, we should get this text file as a result. 
straightforward enough, yes. But no, uh, there's also other part of test automation. We have been talking about the generations of test automation, meaning that, of course, even if we can include some sources like output files or input activities and inserts and stuff like that, there's still different levels of activity to do. So instead of actually giving these dumb input and output things for the system to see, what sort of other things could we do? Because we want to do test automation. We have now been talking about sort of monkey level test automation, where we just put the computer to do a huge number of fairly simple activities to test out that everything still works as intended. So let's go and take a look into the more in-depth approaches on how the different test automation suits work and what the different generations of test automation actually mean. Okay, so basically uh, software test automation uh, and, and its approaches are divided to five generations of different things. The first generation, the recorded scripts, are just simple, stupid automation things which do uh, everything as monkey see, monkey do approach and click on that part of the screen, click on that, check on that, open that. So basically it's just a script that runs something and records the outcome. The second generation are the engineered scripts, which means that the system actually has enough information that it calls the system function or it does something a bit smarter but it's still just scripting and it keeps doing uh, things like dump this data set to that part see what comes out record this activity and so on and so on going forward from this is the third generation of data driven testing this means that the system actually understands the data it uses it knows what the format is, it knows what to expect, and it knows what is actually going on with the script so that it's it's capable of telling you uh, some sort of an, a guess or rudimentary uh, information about what probably went wrong and what should have happened and what sort of things you got instead of the thing you were expecting. This is taken even more uh, to a more sophisticated level on keyword driven testing when we can also add different activities and actors and uh, different sorts of change of uh, chains of things to the system. Finally, the most current version of the test automation, the model based testing, is a system where the uh, test automation understands the model or of the software we are trying to test or where we are doing quality assurance work and independently is capable of ensuring for example that all the transitions or all the branches or all the different variations of different activities are done correctly uh, uh, whereas in the earlier versions you are expected to script out or define what different variations happen in the model based testing since the system already understands the model of how things happen it independently tries out different things well but let's start with the uh, recorded scripts so of course they record users actions to a script and try to uh, replicate these activities when they are running it independently on a software. There's some simple checks to, which can be done to ensure that things happen correctly, like for example that the window opens in a correct place, but still they are very much unstructured and fragile in a sense that even the slightest change can actually change the behavior of the entire system. They do not 
have that much information over what happens behind the scenes, they just see that things keep happening as they have always happened. And in fact, these recorded scripts or script running is not considered by some a form of test automation because it's simply just running a uh, running a number of activities and then uh, recording what happened after these activities. There's no test automation in a sense that the system doesn't actually understand what it's doing. It's just imitating the user and recording what just happened. The engineered scripts, on the other hand, are more well-designed, modular, robust, documented, maintainable, combinable, uh, usable, means, meaning that there's actually ability to set up things, uh, do a teardown activities, have error detection system in place, for example, with something like XUnit or stuff like that. So you still are making your coding work manually, but you are using a separate test data and you have some things that are implemented and main, maintained just for the sake of test usage. Of course, we know that these things might be problematic in the long run, but the engineered scripts mean that we have ability to have a sort of a self-checking system where we can ensure, for example, that some algorithm is providing the same results or stable results as earlier. And these engineered scripts are usually considered uh, nowadays more of an activity that's done in each, uh, each uh, development process because they are so well supported and usually exist for all languages and for all, for all development engines. The data-driven system means that we take the test design, test data, and these sort of things out from the existing system. We have a test bed, which includes all the test or the data which is required for the running the test activities. So we have one driver script which done, does all the test cases and we also have external test data which can be edited with our programming skills so that we actually have people who can design new cases or ensure that the data, actu data actually covers all the branches without having to uh, do anything with the embedded test data or self-test scenarios, which were the problem with the previous approach. Because now we can have people uh, who have no programming skills to participate in activities, and we can have business people, customers, and these sort of people uh, as uh, data uh, deliverers, deliverers or data designers, seeing that all the different activities happen. Of course, and this also means that if we have to change something and the embedded data is no longer valid, we don't have to worry about that because the embedded data and the embedded self-test uh, things no longer exist. So we can just uh, have everything checked by checking the data-driven uh, parts and the data which is given as an input to the test engine that runs everything. So, uh, going one step further, we even can have the keyword-driven testing. Now we can actually have the different keywords depicting different activities so that we can have, for example, like the test case here, open browser window, input text to field, click button, and there should be a title, welcome page, and the teardown activity to close the browser. So the robot framework is, for example, one of these sort of things. We, this is very well known and well supported uh, test automation tool for Python. And this actually increases the usability of the test cases because it also ensures that you can write your new test cases without actually having to meddle with, uh, with the source code. So you are uh, welcome or able to do different variations of activities simply by adding more cases on this uh, framework, which ensures that every, all these things happen. And for example, the ac action activities here, open browser, input text, 
click button title should be. They are instructions for the framework so that it understands what should be happening when these things are expected to run. This also, well, uh, means that the uh, test cases, of course, can be edited, added, uh, managed, maintained, even without the developers or programmers available. There can be a drastic changes to the entire system, and the keyword-driven testing doesn't actually even care about the visual presentation of the system, as long as the things are same to the certain degree. So we are solving the Oracle problem by not paying attention to too many details. For example, with the example here, if the system doesn't care what, the brow what browser it opens into or how many other uh, sub-windows or frames there are, but the, the only thing it actually cares about is that it opens a browser, there's a field in which it puts two sets of text and clicks a button named button 12, and then you should have a new window where or redirected to a new window where there's a title welcome page. And that's it. It doesn't care for anything else. So you can define all the different variations and even use some, use some random generator approach to recreate new the to create new test cases. And that actually is one of the things which the next generation of text automation, the model-based testing actually does. So this is yeah this is a robot framework example if you want to see more of those things you can always go to the robot framework webpage and see the examples there it's a fairly straightforward and quite easy to understand approach so I'd I heartily recommend that you go check it out because that's one thing that's fairly much used especially in the Finnish software industry but the last generation the model based testing it actually includes all the automated, all the activities uh, starting from the test case generation, execution, and analysis of what happened. This means that we make a model of the system, sort of a state machine, with not particularly ex or exactly like it's done in the UML, for example, but still close enough that the, the system actually understands what happens and how things should happen. So when we are, have included all these things to the model, then we just allow the system to start running things. So it tries to, for example, in case of a media player, it increases the volume and switches the uh, next song, decreases the volume, goes to the previous song, adds random track, does this, does that, and does those things. And finally, you can leave it to play or do independent testing work for a very long time when the system just tests out different variations and branches and trees on the, on the model to ensure that everything works and everything works independently of each other. Or in case if it finds something that, doesn't, uh, that uh, gives you a result which wasn't expected, then it tries to use its branch coverage to find out all the places or the directions or the variations of activities which cause similar failure or the similar problem. So basically, it's trying to simulate people doing the testing work, uh, randomly trying out how the different system works in different ways. And of course, if you run this with computer, where you have uh, 10,000 simulated test users doing 10,000 different things, it also allows you stuff like uh, performance testing or stress testing if we are talking about web service. But it also allows that every little variation is taken into account and probably tested at least once. So as mentioned here, we have the test execution engine uh, working as a middleman between the model and the system. The model is the behavioral model explaining what the system can do. So what can happen when we are in a main window, what we can do, what we can press. And the test generator creates number of test scripts, which the adapter runs on the system. Then the adapter records everything the system gave us an output to a 
log which is then analyzed by the test execution and test uh, testing framework engine to see if there's something that's uh, su um, suspect of a failure uh, and of course this means that you have to define what you want what you define as a failure but that's a separate issue in this case so basically if we consider these different mat maturity levels of test automation or at least the different generations of test automation uh, in general there's uh, some differences and benefits but also challenges for example in addition of uh, these things listed here for example recorded scripts impossible to maintain in practice uh, or keyword driven testing does near natural language test definition work in practice it all uh, it also includes the things that if we go towards the new generation of stuff it also usually is more uh, knowledge oriented or, uh, or requires certain specialization knowledge and skills which we don't necessarily have in our organization and it's also more costly of course the flip side of this coin is that uh, the, the core benefit behind these things is that uh, we get more sophistication we get more useful test automation and we get more and better results with uh, with successful implementation of each uh, different level of uh, with each uh, additional level or layer of test automation but of course the problem is that how can we say and be certain that we are going to get a success because not all implementation projects are that of course well uh, these are the things that we, you have to consider when you are running a project. So this is also something that software maintenance should take into account. What is the level of test automation you want to have? And what is the actual benefit you are looking for? Test automation because of test automation is not feasible approach because it's simply waste of money if there's no real need or use for test automation. But although in almost any type of software project there should be at least some use so finally there's some couple of ideas which are based on the test automation activities these are something that's not really relevant to our course we have been talking about integrate um, uh, in uh, continuous delivery and continuous integration and uh, DevOps and these sort of things beforehand but for example the acceptance test driven development means and is something that actually more or less uses the ideas of test automation so create automation test it often use customers as someone who defines your test set and then move on with your product and also we are uh, if we can separate the testing work and test data from the people who are doing the testing work and we can for example use the business people or our customers as someone who provides us with the useful information we can add more collaboration and communication into our project of course if we are using some sophisticated test framework then this is something that we can do but of course this would require for things like interviews and people who are checking out that the data which is inputted for the testing and quality assurance is something feasible although on the other hand this also means that if we are using a software which is already live has customers has data generated by itself we can use a set of real life data to check that everything works as, as expected so there's a number of a number of roles here this is this is more about or less about how we can use existing customers in quality assurance work in uh, testing software when it's in development or in or especially if it when it's in maintenance so i'm not going to go through this framework in a very detailed way because this is this isn't really something that we are talking about on this uh, lecture but still it's a healthy reminder to understand that if we have ability to separate for example the test data or from the test uh, 
system or we can do something that we have a separate testing environment or test bed then we can also probably use existing customer data or customer ideas to check and ensure and test out that these new ideas are, are actually uh, worthy of implementing also to gain more knowledge or ideas for example what sort of changes to the user interface might be useful or interesting at least to try out so uh, the test driven software engineering it's uh, well it's an idea that we create test and then uh, it provides immediate feedback to the developer it's it, it's a um, uh, very nice idea let's put it this way and so basically we use customers we me use metrics of true progress or true feedback to get immediate results on all the changes we have made this is basically something that continuous delivery is already more or less doing with the daily or weekly releases in which we can immediately see if there's something that warrants a, a change or the, if our fix was broken or if the patch or change we made to the user interface was feasible and actually in the acceptance testing this uh, this also means that uh, uh, or in the ATDD this means that if the test passes then we have already made something that works so it also can be used as a uh, set that we need to define something that has to be completed and before the end of the maintenance cycle or development cycle and when it completes then we know that we have uh, achieved uh, le at least the level of quality we need to achieve on this development cycle so uh, in general there's a couple of frameworks for testing which are something that you might want to at least take a look for of course not all of these are useful in a sense that you do really do not know which one you will be working with in the future but at least they are something that enables you to understand what these sort of frameworks do what are the main features and activities these, in, these enable software development process organizations to do and of course something like robot framework is fairly uh, much used at least in the Nordic countries so that's something that you might want to take a look into any in any case because it's really uh, well put together and it's a representative presentation of the keyword driven development and besides tools uh, what you should you use these frameworks for well here's a list of things for what to automate and what to not of course the traditional idea that tests that are run often regression tests which need fast feedback or which are important but easy to evaluate are things that you of course should automate this fact doesn't change anywhere also things that are expensive to perform manually multi-user tests reliability tests if you can automate them of course you should do them and of course things that are difficult to perform manually uh, complex tests timing critical things stress tests these sort of things of course they, those are the ones you should automate and uh, on the other side of course things that you have to evaluate with your knowledge not with something that's easily provable to be true or false those things of course you should keep doing by hand also things like usability tests look and feel match uh, these sort of things which are sort of soft values for the users and not easily measurable by some mechanical or technical uh, way and of course uh, things that don't really have a value uh, things that you don't have an, uh, an easy or clear-cut answer or simply things that don't really need to be uh, automated or are rarely run for example if we are using some library 
of which it has been stable for a very long time and we don't expect to ever change the version number of that uh, stable auxiliary library then there's no reason to do automation before we actually need to update to a new version of the library because we then might not trust that the new stable version is what it says that it is so in summary uh, the benefits of test automation uh, improved repeatability of tests this is of course given shorter feedback loop uh, makes some types of testing possible performance testing stress testing uh, parallel activity testing or simultaneous connection testing these sort of things also it's a better use of resources if you have money to implement it and maintain it because of course it takes away the tedious and boring repetitive tasks but on the other hand it's really costly and really difficult to make uh, in certain uh, environments or for certain things so you really should commit to test automation or if you don't have the money or resources then you might want to drop the issue also you need to have people who are actually capable of implementing the automation but still if you have those skills you have those resources your skill testers will do a better job with the remaining stuff than trying to uh, or using the, all their time trying out the different tedious boring and simple things of course the challenges and pitfalls well unrealistic expectations this has been always an issue with the test automation high initial investment which has been mentioned several times the maintenance work which is problematic if the people or the brains behind the actual implementation of the test automation leave uh, technical problems the tools may not be that good false sense of security you don't see that there's any problems because you have test automation but on the other hand the test automation only says that your everything is still working uh, similarly as it has been before not telling that there's no problems with the product and also other organizational issues but what else can you expect when this is a software engineering uh, process so what to remember from this lecture is that there's a different generations and sophistication levels of test automation systems these tools exist there's frameworks there's tools IBM uh, suit for example for doing a model based testing uh, robot framework for doing keyword based testing and different uh, systems allow sophisticated patches X unit that sort of stuff also the other thing is why you need test automation why would you ever do that or on the flip side why would you don't want test automation what is the reason to adopt this approach and why should you avoid using test automation if those uh, that situation ever arises finally there's no Wednesday consulting hour this week I'm really really sorry about it because this will be the second consecutive week when we don't have the consulting hour last week was a lecture week this week I am doing international master's programs uh, interviews for the Monday Tuesday and Wednesday so I cannot guarantee that I will have time to actually be present at the consulting hour but do please remember that there's a Moodle page help desk uh, for this course so if you have large number of small questions you should probably send them there because they most likely are issues which everyone can answer or in which everyone can help the worst way of doing this is sending a million little emails to me because I'll of course while I will reply to all these things that arise it causes so much overburden to actually remember to answer answer to each small item so if you have small minor details or technical questions about the project works for example you might as well put them to the Moodle pages and ask help there I will answer answer to them and if you sort of have an idea what you probably is a good idea you can also help other uh, course mates on their work 
Finally, that's that about test automation. On the assignments, we have a couple of things about the other maintenance tools, which are, for example, tracers and these sort of things. But those are left for the reading assignment, which, which includes uh, software engineering book of knowledge, this webbook this week. And the most recent version of this webbook is also added to the course additional readings section. So check that out. Also, other assignment is a Docker based assignment. So that's also interesting stuff. You should definitely take a look at that because that is the future and that is one of the things you will need to learn when you hit software engineering industry. So this was the eighth lecture. Uh, have a nice rest of the week and uh, I'll be back in one week. Thank you.